Well, hello everybody. It's Brian on a uh, special time normally. I uh, don't normally stream at this time. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for, for joining us here, our viewers on uh, Twitch and YouTube. I have a guest today, and the reason that I'm streaming at this special time today is because of the, our time differences. Uh, only because we're on one Earth, but we have at least 24 time zones. So um, uh, Josh reached out to me on the OWASP Slack and said, hey, you know, got a black hat training coming up, but I'm really you know, passionate about AppSec and some of the gaps there between security and AppSec. And I wanted to have Josh on to, to talk about that. So welcome, Josh, to the, to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Great to be here. Right on. Okay, so as we as we tend to do on on our show here, when we do interviews like this, uh, everybody has an origin story. Everybody got into security in different ways. Would like to talk about your, uh, you know, your background uh, in AppSec and how you got to be where you're at right now, and uh, um, you know, maybe a little bit about the Black Hat training that you're given. Yeah, fantastic. So, uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I got my taste of security back in in the school IT room. I think it's a relatively common story where you know, suddenly all these computers are. Oh, what can we do with this? Um, although after after school, I kind of sort of it fell to the wayside a little bit, and it took me some time to get back into it. I started off doing sort of general IT consulting and IT risk consulting, and gradually sort of broke my way into uh, IT security. And I'd done some software development in the past, and that sort of pushed me towards the the application security side, like the software security side. So I spent many years sort of working more on sort of the, the the hacking side, the penetration testing side, working, coming in, you know, getting, getting the client's application, breaking it, giving them some uh, findings and suggestions and moving on. Um, right. And gradually I got to the stage where I, you know, okay, breaking things is fun for a while, but I wanted to sort of be having more of an impact. I wanted to be trying to have some slightly longer term impact. And I started getting involved in projects actually working with developers, working with organizations to try and build software securely in the first place, sort of work as like an internal product security or application security consultant. Um, and that's sort of brought me where I am today. I work for a company called Bounce Security, and we're a small boutique consultancy. And our focus is very much not on the breaking side, but on the building side and you know, helping organizations to either improve or operate their, their product security programs. Very nice. Okay. So um, you've been doing this a few years, and so you've seen more than a few engagements with regards to AppSec, probably pen tested a few apps that you're like, uh, you yeah, know, oh my God, what are you doing? Uh, what, are, what are some of the overarching issues you see with, with uh, you know, AppSec or when you come into an engagement or, you know, you come in and you're trying to teach people, you know, I would say proper AppSec. I, well, that's another question we can ask later. What is proper AppSec to you? But what are some mm -hmm. of the biggest things that you see overall when you when you come in? Is it lack of maturity or is there something else? So I think I think the, the very sort of basic problem is that you know, when we're talking about application, application security, we're talking about developers. We're talking about people whose job it is to come in and build software. And they've generally learned either in a boot camp or in the university or computer science program or something else. And I think security is very much under, you know, undercovered in those sort of programs. It's not really covered in, in much detail. It's not something that's really considered up front. It's not really something that's considered in, in that tuition. So they come into a development role. And often they don't have that background in security. And then they're Job is okay. Now you need to build this piece of software. Now you need to build this feature. Now you need to fix this bug. Um, but security often doesn't have a seat at that table. It's not often you know success criteria or consideration. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is sort of seeing security as an equal citizen alongside all the other considerations that go into building an application, um, and then making sure that you know, developers have the time and the resources and the you know, the the guidance of how to actually build things in a secure way. So I think that that awareness is is one of the bigger challenges. The other side of that, I think, is that you know, I, I came from slightly more of a software development background. So I was sort of more familiar with, with code. Even then, I had to learn a lot about development before I really understood, OK, how can I have impact here? How can I fit into this process? And so you know, we talked about my Black Hat course. So I did a course last year at Black Hat as well, um, a slightly different focus, sort of more focused on, on tools and understanding how to use the tools. But a lot of the people who came there were security people who had basically had application security suddenly dumped into their lap. You know, suddenly they were the application security person as well as the regular security person. 
And they're like, well, now what now what do I do? You know, I'm not don't come from a development background, maybe I come from a network or an IT support background. Now I've got this hat of application security. What you know, how how am I going to handle that? And I think this year's course I've aimed at a slightly sort of I've, I've I've changed the focus slightly to sort of focus. Okay, well let's let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about you know what does AppSec actually mean and you know, what what's some of the wider context here to understand well how can I actually have impact in this area? Right. It so one of a, one of the comments from our, our speakers said in university I didn't want to hand in my first C plus plus assignment because I couldn't figure out how to trap errors yet the teacher said that didn't matter and just to hand in a, a program that worked under ideal conditions. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not how AppSec should work. I, I would imagine some of the, the the more you know best practices that you put into place would be things like trapping errors to find out if there's a problem or uh, getting rid of debug symbols or something like that to keep uh, people from being able to do nefarious things. Um, when you give this training at Black Hat, and I think we should you know probably talk about that, what's the split between security and and developers or is it just people who know appsec who kind of dabble in both sides or i mean what what does the demographics look like there for that mm -hmm. so i've given i've given a training at a few venues i think black hat but black hat's very much a security conference you know i think if you know most of the people people i spoke to there most people i was working with there were they, they either had security in their job title or security is at the most of their day to day um i've also done the training at OWASP conferences as well. I've done it a few, at a few different OWASP conferences. I did it in Dublin, in San Francisco, um, hopefully doing it in Lisbon, but uh, you know, again, a slightly different focus. Like the, the old focus of the course was very much about the, the, um, the AppSec tools, um, because I think historically, you know, if you talk about AppSec, it was very much, oh, well, um, we do a penetration test. And, and that, maybe that was like five, six years ago. And now you talk about AppSec and it's like, oh, we've got this tool, we've got that tool, and we've got the other tool. So I still, you know, this, the origin of this course was in sort of about tools and okay, how to build processes around tools and use them effectively. And I've had a fair amount of success working with developers at OWASP conferences for that and you know, getting um, input. And you know, it's very much a variety of different audiences. But like I said, when I saw that Black Hat was very much okay, these are security people and these are often not really application security people, these are mainstream security people. So that's where I sort of focused it more on um, that, that sort of target audience of. Uh, security people who want to understand more about AppSec. Certainly, a lot of the knowledge there is useful for developers as well. And that's, I think, you know, we tend to see developers more at the, the OWASP conferences and, you know, other conferences where it's slightly more, more varied. Right. So you, you mentioned uh, in your description there, you said the, the, the tool you should process is around the tooling. Um, do, does that, does that hamstring people to have to develop to the tool instead of creating processes and then finding the tool to fix that. It seems like that'd be kind of backward to me. You'd want to create the process and then find the tools. It feels like you're, you're restricted by the tools that you have because either maybe you have processes where the tools don't exist. So then you don't have tools to do those things. So uh, maybe this goes back to some of the best practices that, you know, I thought we would touch on at some point. Do you, do you build, you, you, you said build, their processes to the tools you have. And for me, that, that seems backwards, but I'd, I'd love to hear your take on that. So I guess that there are, there are two sides to this. I think on the one hand, you know, if you're starting from a you know, completely you know, green, greenfield organization, you haven't got a tools in place, you haven't got um, a lot of this, you know, a, a lot of this infrastructure, whatever else in place for you know, doing software security scanning, whether it's dynamic, whether it's static, if you've not got that in place already, then you've got the luxury of sort of saying, okay, well, we're starting from scratch. We can make a decision about how we want this process to work. We can audition some different tools. We can try out some different tools. We can decide what works well for us. Um, but and I, I think that's certainly something that you know, the knowledge in the course comes to cover as well, comes to give ideas about, okay, if you're starting from nothing, here's the, here's the, the, the considerations you want to have for actually evaluating tools and thinking about, you know, what's going to work for me. But many, many, many cases, I see organizations, they've already got the tools in place. They've already heavily invested in these tools. They've already got them there. And therefore, I want to be able to say, okay, you know, I don't want to just come and say, well, okay, throw all this out and start again. I want to say, look, these are the tools that you've got. Now, you know, how can we get more value out of these existing tools? You're probably not going to be able to throw them out in the, you know, mid, the, mid, the short to midterm. So how can you work with what you've got? How can you build a process around that? How can you understand the tool better? In a way that lets you say, okay, well, I'm now going to structure the process around this tool. I'm going to figure out you know, what 
I want this tool to do, what sort of um, scans I want it to perform, and I'm going to figure out who's going to take the output of that based on what the tool actually supports. So mm. yeah, if you've got that greenfield site where you can start from nothing, then I think there's a lot of you know, valuable information you can use to think about what's going to work for me. But often, if you're not in that situation, you've got this sort of either you know, this, this legacy situation where you've got tools already in place, you need to make the best out of what you've got. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's awesome. Uh, so, and, and, and in hindsight, that, that does make sense. You don't want to throw everything out and start over again. It's not realistic to do so. Uh, you mm. know, and, and some developers are tied to specific tools because there's really only one tool you can do. So if like you have your black ducks or your coverities or whatever, if you're, you're programming yeah. in a certain programming language, you don't have much of a choice in what tools you're going to use. There's one scanner for, you know, Rust or there's you know one scanner for C++. So that, 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 that kind of makes sense. Um, yeah, I think a lot, a lot of the time as well, like the, you know, the existing, I think a lot of training that's out there sort of assumes, okay, you're starting from scratch and now you're going to build this you know, very complicated CI, CD pipeline with all these new tools. And I, I don't think that's realistic for a lot of organizations. I think a lot of organizations need to be able to take a slightly more um, high level view of, okay, this is what we've got and here's how we're going to get the best out of it. Right. Right. So let's say you don't have your green field, your, your brand new start. Uh, you come in and you're, you know, you're discussing AppSec. I'd, I'd say you're almost what an AppSec dev rel in developer <laughs> relations for AppSec. Uh, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around, you know, having people who aren't salespeople sell products to developers uh, and be cheerleaders for, you know, Rust or whatever. I'm like, I'm sure there's some people watching this going like, you just don't understand, man. Developer relations is where it's at. I, I completely understand. Um, I don't actually. What are some of the what are some of the checklist items that you like to come in and you go, okay, we're gonna take stock. You need, you know, you you have you have eggs. You know, you don't have chicken eggs, you may have a duck egg or whatever, but the idea is you've you you've got the ingredients necessary to have a proper CI C D pipeline, but you don't have it or you know, your best practices are probably fairly generic, right? You need you need to have a, a method by which you're building code, or you know, um, mm. what are some of those you know ingredients that are are a must have to you know have an AppSec program in that case? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, so I think that it's it's funny you mentioned DevRel because I often think that you know, the the idea of sort of being this ambassador for something to another group of people is it, it very it very much resonates with me as a security person. You know, and I'm working with developers, I'm sort of the dev role for security, as in I'm saying, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to like promote security, I'm trying to like build, bridge that gap between security and developers. So I think it's, uh, I, think, I think it's very uh, interesting comparison. I've often, I've said uh, a couple of times, I think that OWASP should probably have some, some sort of dev role role within OWASP to sort of, you know, whose job it is to, to uh, reach out. I know that I've got a new uh, head of communities now, uh, Jason, who I think is going to sort of partially take that idea, but I think, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of crossover there. But uh, in terms of building an AppSec program, so again, like I think that historically, a lot of a lot of AppSec has been wrapped up in all these different tools. And you know, certainly something we often get brought in specifically to talk about the tools and to, to actually look at the tools and try and make them more effective. But I think if we're looking at a, an AppSec program, I like to think more widely. I like to think, okay, well, tools are going to be part of that to a certain extent, but I want to think more widely. I want to think about, okay, what, you know, I want to, build some sort of, I guess, not necessarily comprehensive application security program, but an application security program that comes to answer all different stages of, of the development process. I think the number one, number one part of doing that is something I think has sort of been lost historically, which you know, we talk about a security person, we talk about developers. Okay, the security person needs to go to developers and talk, teach them about security or help them with security. Um, and there, but there's, you know, there's this trope of, okay, well, security is everyone's job. You know, security should be an initial part, you know, full part of the process. But you know, security isn't necessarily everyone's job. You know, if someone's job is governed by their management and their, engineer, you know, their leadership and whoever's you know, overseeing that group they work in. So if a developer's, developer is assessed against, okay, how fast can they deliver code? How fast can they deliver features? Then that's their job. So I think the very first thing, and I heard this from uh, a guy I was talking to, he um, has an ASPM product, his name's uh, Francesco Caplini. Um, and he talked about the idea of shift up. You know, we had this old trope of shift left, this idea, okay, well, we're going to you know, push all this security stuff earlier. But you know, before we get into that, we need to shift up. We need to actually have that senior sponsorship to say, we would like to build secure software. We would like to improve the level of security in the software that we're pushing out. And therefore, we need that buy-in from 
some form of leadership. We need someone in, in development leadership, not security leadership, development leadership to say, you know, we see this as important. We want to invest in this. We want to have our developers have this as part of their roles, part of their job. And you know, therefore, we're going to do what it takes to make that happen. Because ultimately, I think in, in, in many, many cases, security tends to be an advisor. So, so security people are providing guidance. Certainly, there aren't enough security people to do everything. Often, we'll need to rely on other people to do the things that we're suggesting or that we're advising. And then, you know, when it comes to AppSec, that's the developer. So I think the number one thing is to make sure that you've got that buy-in up front from leadership to say, OK, well, the developers are now going to have this as part of their job. They're going to have time allocated to that. If, you know, for example, a, a typical development increment is two or three weeks, let's say every two or three weeks they sort of plan, okay, for the next two or three weeks, then how much of that time is going to be on security activities? How much of that time is going to be on things related to, to building either security features into the product or addressing security bugs that have been identified? Right. So, uh, to, to go on. Yeah, to, our, to uh, one of our listeners, uh, Magnesium here, says, my experience here is an exhaustive bit, seen several attempts at AppSec to be resisted by developers. The only way I've seen this work is by security as being a developer partner, shouldering some of the load and acting as subject matter expert, not getting in the way. I was actually going to have a similar follow-on question here. It's It feels like, so, you know, security is suggesting going up to leadership to get buy-in. The problem is there's it's not a it's not a triangle in this case it's more like a like a trapezoid or something like that but you've got to have developers who also want to have this happen it's got to come up from both sides all the stakeholders have to want to have that so I guess the the base and to continue with this this metaphor the the, the base has to be fairly solid you know you have to have a good relationship between security and developers to begin with to be able to go up both sides of this trapezoid to their respective leadership because it's not just one leadership right you're not going to go to the ceo and go hey i think we should have you know secure stuff it's going to be you know the ciso or the head security person it's going to be the head you know developer manager and then there's going to be some cross talk between those two folks because it's like why do we need this oh yeah we, we. so uh, it's complicated right it's 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 not mm -hmm. just a, a one-sided thing your shift up is going to have to come from multiple sides it may not it may be a grc thing as well so you're going to have different different pillars of that 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 structure if you will um it, it, it so should you start maybe with the developer security relationship first or should you go you know ha, I, the one thing i don't want to do is have this kind of communication where it's like i'm telling security management management's telling you know developer management and then it's going down there that doesn't lead to a good relationship so what are some of the things you would suggest there in that case to you know um you know to magnesium's point and to my point on 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 you know getting that implemented with shift up shift up in this case yeah so i think you know, shift shift up is part of it i think that you know, one of the you know, i've seen a lot of Lots of anti patterns in terms of okay, how can the security and development relationship go wrong? And yeah, I think Shift Up comes to address one of those anti patterns. You know, one of the anti patterns is that security are basically coming from the side and saying, "Oh, can you, uh, you know, do this for me <laughs> in your spare? You know, can you do this activity? Can you fix this bug in your, in your sort of spare time as a developer? Because you know, I've not got senior buy-in for this, but you know, I need you to do this. So you know, this idea of okay, I'm now adding to your workload. You have you know." Eight hours in your day to work. I'm now adding a ninth hour because you don't have time allocated from this from the above. And I think that's one of the you know, key anti pattern and one of the things that damages that relationship where people see security and they think, oh, you're going to bring me more work to do that I don't have time to do because I'm not, you know, I don't have buy in to actually do it. So I think you know, that's part of, the, of improving that relationship. But it's certainly not the only thing. Uh, I think right. one of the, you know, again, the, the, the motivator, I think, one of the, one of the key things that pushed me from going from doing this work to actually creating a training course about tools was seeing organizations where you know, their entire security um, ecosystem, entire software security ecosystem had been chasing tool results. It had become, okay, we've now put these tools in, and now we've got loads and loads and loads of results from these tools. Now what? Now what do we do about them? You know, they sort of degraded this state where they had they had security champions, and we will talk more, more about security champions after, but they had the security champion. But the security champion was, okay, you are voluntold to be the security champion, and now your job is to go through these tools without tool results and figure out what's going on. Right. And that was their entire sort of security experience. Their entire security experience was, was tool results. And the problem with tool results is that often there are lots of false positives, there are lots of things that don't make sense, there are lots of things that it's not clear are they actually important or they're not, not important. 
Right. So it becomes, it becomes a stage where their entire association of security was, oh, no, not more nonsense that's come out of this tool. You know, that was their perspective on application security. And that was, again, a very sort of difficult thing to overcome. It was a very much damaged that relationship between security and developers because it got to a stage where developers are hiding under the desk when security came in because they're like, oh, I'm not, I don't want to talk about these tool results now. I have a job to do. I have work to do. And right. I think that you know, that's a, a second anti-pattern, making sure that the, what you're giving them, what you're asking them to do, makes sense to begin with, isn't going to frustrate them. If you're going to you want to use tools, you need to make sure that what's coming out of the tools is targeted and makes sense and isn't just a whole load of work for no actual security value. Right. Um, right. I think that maybe a, th a third thing there is meeting them where they are. I think that often, because again, there's this sort of gap between security people and development, pe and development people, they may be using different applications, they're using different ticketing systems, they're using sort of different paradigms for, for how they work. And I think often if you can go into and use the systems and use the processes that developers are used to, then you're sort of coming into their sort of usual work processes. You're not pulling them into some other system or some other interface or some other process they're not used to, but you're, you're becoming part of their overall process. So I like to try and incorporate security activities into their general ticketing. You know, most, most development organizations are using something like uh, Jira or GitHub issues or GitHub projects, whatever it is, to track their work. If you can put security activities in there as well, obviously, you know, in coordination, not just throwing stuff over the fence, but if that's now part of their you know, the, the work process they're used to, the system that they're used to, you're already making their lives easier, you're already reducing that mental load that it's going to take for them to actually you know, get into that mindset of, okay, I need to address this security issue now. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the one of the biggest things that I've seen on pushback from developers, especially with you know security tools that we think they should be using, like SCAs and stuff, is the ungodly large amounts of false positives. Um, and it, it's one of those things. It's like we know they're going to come up because you know you're. I don't want to say code quality issues, but there's there's definitely some blame on both sides. Security doesn't want to have to deal with trying to verify every false positive, so they throw it over to the developers. Developers don't have time to look at all these false positives, or you know they they know that it's a legitimate issue, but you know because the code needs to be able to do you know Rust unsafe kind of methods or you know whatever uh, you know the garbage collection doesn't need to work on this or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of time and effort spent there. Um, it's just one of those unfortunate things that we have to deal with. It's yes, beta wolf. It's clearly 99% the developer's fault. Uh, firmly said tongue in cheek there. Um, so these are the kinds of cracks that start in a beginning AppSec program where the gaps start being created. You know, security has, I would say, unrealistic ideas of what we need the developers to do. The developers have unrealistic expectations that they're just going to be able to do whatever they want without any kind of, you know, impunity or any kind of uh, uh, bits there. Is, is that what you're seeing in terms of, you know, where gaps begin or, you know, can you go in when you're, you know, into a, what they call a mature organization and go, ah, oh, okay, I can see already, you know, security is just telling devs what to do and devs think that, you know, it's, it's complete freedom. What, what are some of the trends you see there? Is it the go fast culture? Is there other things there involved that maybe I'm not privy to? Uh, that that cause these gaps, and are there ways to remediate those? So I think that the you, know, you you mentioned the go fast culture, and that that's a massive massive thing. I think that security tends to be slow, um, and that's that's you know, especially if they're they're trying to act as as some sort of gate or as some sort of review stage or something like that. Security tends to be slow, whereas developers are often moving. Pretty fast, you know. Like I say, a, a typical development increment might be two or three weeks. It may be that you know within three weeks they've coded a new feature and and deployed it. Now, if you have a backlog on your security or you haven't got time to carry out security activities that some you know, the security people need to do, then they're, they're going to be either a blocker or it's just not going to happen. It's just going to fall right. to the wayside. I mean, my so my boss is a guy called uh, Avi Duglin, and uh, he works. He does a lot of work around threat modeling. He's very sort of well known for threat modeling and. And recently, you know, he teaches a lot of threat modeling as well. He does training for threat modeling, but he sort of tried to shift focus recently. So he's not just talking about threat modeling, but he's talking about, well, how can we make this sustainable? How can we keep this process going? It's not just, okay, well, I now know how to threat model, but it's okay, well, how within, organi within an organization can you make threat modeling into a process that can be done when it needs to be done, when it, whether that needs to be every few weeks or whether it needs to be for particular features? You know, how do you make sure that carries on? Because that's one of the things he sees often that he'll go in and train security about people about threat modeling or certain developers about threat modeling, but they won't have time because everything is moving insanely fast. If, unless they've got those those plans up front, those 
um, you know, that mechanism up front for saying, okay, here's how we're going to make it work in the time available. Right. So I think that nowadays, you know, I, I saw, you know, I joked at the beginning about, okay, well, AppSec five, 10 years ago was a pen test. And now, you know, last, last few years, it's tools. I think now there's a lot more talk about a more comprehensive SS, you know, so secure software development lifecycle. Um, but I, all too often I've seen that as a, as a project. It's like, okay, well, we're going to build this long document of secure development lifecycle. Here are all the activities we need to do. And now you need to go and do that. You know, I've, I've worked in an organization. I've worked as a consultant where I was brought in. I was like, okay, we just built this giant SSTLC, this giant secure development program. Um, you now need to implement it. You're going to spend three weeks implementing it in each development organization, in each de development group, and then move on to the next development group. And I've looked at this thing. It's huge. You know, it's 20, 30 activities. You know, Developers aren't going to start doing that immediately. They aren't going to have time to start doing that immediately. You know, just understanding and accepting, okay, well, what do we need to do for one activity? It's, it's effort. It's not what they're used to doing. It's not their, 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 usual, uh, their usual activities. So one of the mm -hmm. things that we've started doing now is saying, okay, well, we need to not look at this as a project, a short-term thing that we're going to you know, write a very big document and it's going to magically happen, but it becomes a more of a question of, okay, we're going to take a slowly, slowly approach. We're going to think, okay, what are the high-value things that we want to start off with? How and then how are we going to make sure this actually happens? So forget, okay, well, how do you actually do this? You know, what, what are the mechanical processes of carrying out this activity? You know, so I talk about threat modeling. Okay, we can talk about how you do threat modeling, whether you use stride, whether you use a, a time boxed approach, but forget all that for a second. Who is going to do this? Who's going to have responsibility for doing this? How we do, do we make sure that they have the time to do this? How would we make sure that, okay, for every new feature that is rated as say as high security risk, as something that's gonna, you know, likely to have security issues in it, how do we make sure that there is a Two hour slot that's agreed for the developers to get together in a room and actually think about what could go wrong and come up with some sort of basic threat model. Right. How do we make sure that's going to happen? Who is responsible for that within the development team? You know, up and down the chain. Who's you know, we, we started using Racky matrixes as a saying, cool. who's who's um, accountable for making sure that happens? Who's actually responsible for doing it? You know, let's actually treat this like the sort of the, the, the project activity that it is. It's not just something we can say, okay, well, from now on you're doing threat modeling, here's a model called Stride, off you go. It's about saying, okay, we want to build in a new activity, which means we need to make sure that we know who's going to do it, and how it's going to happen. And then, then obviously, how it's actually measured, how we're going to make sure that we understand, is this working effectively? So one of the key things is saying, okay, we're not going to throw everything at developers at once. We're not going to say, okay, here's all of the you know, whole secure development process, but rather we're going to go slowly. We're going to say, here's how we want to start off a few activities, and here's how we're going to make sure that they actually happen and they stay sustainable. Nice. Um, <clears throat> you, you were talking about threat models. I think we've talked with a couple of people about threat models this year. Um, Kevin Johnson, um, our, our good friend, uh, uh, Jared DeFreitas. Uh, um, you mentioned the Bounce Security does threat modeling uh, at scale, I would assume, for like large... I, I, I assume the threat model is for like Platform esque level, like large levels, and and you know they'll they'll drill down necessarily. Uh, uh, it, does it does it, so you're going to have to go beyond the threat model, right? If you you can't just hand developers a threat model and go, oh yeah, here's here's what you need to protect against. Um, do you do things like user test cases or uh, you do what 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 deliverables other than just a you know a Visio diagram or you know draw.io that you give them? There must be other stuff that you're adding there, like you know, regular hygiene kind of things to help mitigate some of those issues. Yeah, I, mean, I use yeah, you know, I use threat model as an example as just an, of an activity rather than just sort of talking ab abstractly about activities. Um, right. but, you know, certainly we do want to have a situation where we've got security pro activities spread throughout the development lifecycle. So we might start off early on by okay, you're building out functional requirements for this new feature. What are the security? You know, requirements from a business perspective. You know, what is going to make, you, know, you usually have a product manager whose job it is to decide, okay, this is what this feature needs to do. This is what this new functionality needs to do from a business perspective. So what's going to make, you know, what's going to ruin that product manager's day? What's going to ruin the user's day if it happens from a security perspective and have that already considered at an early stage? And then move on into um, something like you know, threat modeling once it becomes more clear how the new function is going to be laid out. It may be that you look at having some sort of design review or having some sort of simple checklist that goes through, okay, well, here's things we need to think about when we're building the design. And then we want to make sure there's guidance available at the implementation stage as well. So it's all very well saying, okay, well, you need to make sure that you're authenticating users who are coming through this way. You need to make sure that you're protecting your database access against SQL injection. But you also need to have that guidance 
for the developers to actually use at development time say, okay, well, here's how I prevent this. Here's the, the in-house library that we use in my language to prevent SQL injection. Here's our in-house guidance for how you make sure you authenticate users. You have to check this particular token. You have to check these items of the token. You're having that guidance as well. And the idea is that you want to build this process that you know, it comes into the what they're already doing, but gives them that guidance all the way through and gives them sort of that hand-holding all the way through. So it's not just you know, one stage early on and then you know, forget, okay, you need to secure app. Oh, how am I going to secure my app? Oh, I, you know, <laughs> I don't know. That's, right. uh, that's your problem. You're a developer. You figure that out. No, that's not, that's not how we want to work. We want to make sure that each stage, they've got that guidance. Um, and right. ideally, you've given, you know, given them some sort of uh, resources, some sort of training. I mean, I think you know, training sort of about secure coding is one of, the, one of those tricky things. I think it's very, very hard to get right. It seems to be a lot of organizations do that because their regulation requires they do it or they've got some sort of compliance that requires them to do it without really investing in it and thinking about how to do it effectively. Um, but I think it, giving them, making sure the developers know where to look, know where to ask is a key thing as well. Make sure they've got that continuity all the way through. Um, because also okay. once you've got those requirements, once you've got that, okay, well, we need to make sure this happens from a security perspective, that then comes in later on as well. Okay, well, we've now got, we're now at the QA stage. We're now at the testing stage. Well, you know, QA are used to testing against requirements. They know that, okay, well, this function should do this. It should um, provide this feature in the application. It should allow the, uh, the user to change this piece of data in their profile. But if at the same time, you define security requirements, then QA can verify those security requirements as well. You get you continue that continuity. You continue that consideration. Okay, how does security impact each stage of the process? But ultimately, security needs to act as you know, a guide and a resource for this to provide advice. But we need to be in a situation where either the architect or the developer or the QA person, the QA engineer, is able to, to do that themselves with the resources they've provided. Nice. Yeah, you you were talking about some racy charts. Uh, you know, when I was trying to be a proper PMP certified program or project manager, you know, the racy charts came in stakeholder engagement or stakeholder identification, being able to understand those. It, I don't want to say it almost feels like we don't need to necessarily interact with the developers a lot, according to you know, it, you know, using examples of QA and and talking about that. But I would almost almost suggest that. Uh, your your organization should have some kind of project or program, sorry, product development process, or you know, when you're creating whatever it is you're going to be creating, the PMs or the project managers, if there is one, or you know, whatever that amounts to for a development team, if it's the sprint planners or or whatever, it, it feels like by direction those sh people should be engaging, you know, developers, product people, privacy, that you know, there there should be other people involved in the product development process there. And, and I don't know if, if you're agile based, if there's actually a product, you know, project manager, but um, it, it feels like if we do it right, security can reduce the amount of friction between the developers because the developers are just implementing what they're told to implement, I think in some cases. Uh, so if you mm -hmm. go to the people who are asking the developers to implement those things and say, Hey, you know, security also needs to be in there as well, or, or, or what have you. I, I think we we tend to just go, okay, let's go to the, the code crunchers first instead of maybe going to the PMs or somebody like that to kind of build that up later. You know, the PMs would be like, ah, yes, we need to talk to, you know, security about this or, you know, maybe we should invite security to the sprint planning meetings. Um, uh, thoughts on on that? Is there, I mean, is it is it better, I wouldn't say a run around or end run, you know, going around these folks, but they're just doing kind of what they're told, right? They're doing it by direction. Mm -hmm. No, it's, I, so you know, the, the, what you allude to—the idea of having all the different people involved—is you know very much, you know, very much, um, I guess, underpins the shift up approach. You know, when you're going to leadership, you're saying, you know, there are jobs for people here. <laughs> there is work that people are going to need to do, do here. It's not just developers who are going to have to do it. It's going to be architects. It's going to be developers. It's going to be QA people. It's going to be product managers. It's potentially going to be project managers as well. Um, there are all sorts of different people who, who need to be involved. And that's why, you know, that's why we end up in this situation of having these racy charts, because it's not just, oh, well, <laughs> it's either security or it's development. It's actually, there are you know, a variety of different people who need to be involved. You know, I gave the experience, the, um, the example earlier on of having you know, business security requirements. Okay, what's going to, you know, what's going to ruin the product manager's day? What's going to ruin the day for the, the person who oversees this product? And that's very much a product management question. That's a business question. It's not a, we can go delve into certain technical details afterwards, but you know, if 
Um, you know, you've got a product where you're saying, okay, well, we're going to, um, we have an e commerce platform and we want to offer discount vouchers. But if right. you know, 1,000 people get a discount voucher when they're not supposed to, that's going to ruin everyone's day. That's not a technical question. That's not a technical vulnerability. That's a, that's a failure of a business process um, in a, something that would be considered a security for, um, failure. But ultimately, it's a business question. That's why someone like the product manager should be having those thoughts and saying, okay, well, what, you know, what's, what can go wrong here? What do we need to prevent against as well? What do we make, need to make sure it doesn't happen? So right. I think that's a you know key a key aspect of it. Saying okay, well there are different people involved here. There are different you know, an engineering team, a development team. And sort of the, the terminology differs um, depending on the company. But there are lots of different personas here. Lots of different people here. And by having that you know, that that racy concept basically helps to say okay, well who is going to be involved with each activity and who's going to be doing it, who's going to be overseeing it, and making sure that not only is someone covering that effort, but also the effort is spread across the different stakeholders across the different personas. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's important to spread the wealth here, you know, and uh, I would imagine the developers, uh, as we learned last week with Mary Gardner, uh, a lot of security is the department of no, even though we don't want to admit it. Uh, we've, I think, I think that ship has sailed and, and we're now holding on to the door with Rose in the middle of the Arctic Ocean right now. Um, and <laughs> being able to I think think smarter. You know, if if we're always going to the same developers or we're going to the same development teams, they're going to start seeing us coming, and and I would say start actively resisting or avoiding us because they only see us when we want something from them. Uh, it, and it, being it depends able on to... that relationship. It depends on that relationship. Like I I worked in an organization and I was working as a product security consultant. So I was I mean, my my day to day was working with developers and working with the um, with the architects. And that organization you know, was quite a big organization. And they had like mainstream security people as well. And these mainstream security people were coming as developers with uh, all sorts of requests and all sorts of requirements. And, and you know, there was, there was one guy in this sort of security team, um, sort of more of infrastructure security, team, whatever, like a different part of security. Um, let's call him Fred. And Fred was just, I don't know, he was very much the, the old school security department of no insanely negative you know, you'd get on a call with him and suddenly like all the happiness and joy would be sucked out of the call you know you'd get on a call with him and it'd just be endless negativity endless no endless this is terrible that's terrible that's terrible and so i could get on a call with him and i could say well yes you are correct about that but that is less important or that's less important or that's lower priority and we're going to focus on this because we know this is higher priority and i i sort of by by being someone who's working a lot with the developers i was able to sort of act as their advocate the other direction and say well actually let's focus on what's really at risk here let's focus on, on the real concerns here and that did a lot to actually build up that relationship and improve that relationship because as the AppSec guy, I was able to say, well, you know, here's what's important you know, to the developers. If I tell you something's important, you know that we, we need to focus on this, but to the outside world, I can help you know, push back on things that uh, are going to be less important or less high priority so that you're not getting this sort of endless input from external security of things that you know, vary in how important they are. So right. you, know, you can, you can you, I think that there definitely is the opportunity to flip that around. You know, Security does have the reputation of the part of no, but at an individual level, you can you can improve that relationship. You can you can improve that uh, that interaction, and you can make you know, developers happier to see you. you. Can help them see the value in what you bring, you know, the knowledge that you bring. Because ultimately, you know, as a security person, you do have a lot of understanding about you. Know, these are the things that are really important. But we also know that you know there are all sorts of different pressures, all sorts of different um, considerations, all sorts of, sorts of different findings. And we, you know, security people, we generally have some perspective on okay, well, how do we prioritize that? Right. Yeah. And um, I think, yeah, yeah, again, this is, you know, you, you said there, we know what's important for security bent, but like, you know, uh, Beta Wolf said, sometimes we don't even have the ability to say no. So we kind of have to, I don't want to say pick our battles, but it is kind of picking our battles. We, you know, we can't go after every memory leak or cross-site scripting uh, that we find. Uh, I, I think sometimes if, you know, we're trying to fight all those battles, every battle, every cross-site scripting that is found or every memory leak or whatever, and, and everything is important, then it quickly becomes nothing is. But um, I, yeah. ideally you want um, also some kind of, I, I, don't, I don't, how do I, how do I, uh, some kind of risk acceptance process, I think, in, in, in all of this to be able to say, look, we've identified these as a potential risk. It may not be, con you know, it may be considered a high risk for us because it leads to potential customer record loss or something. But the organization, it you know, doesn't want to fix it right now. 
uh, you know, raising that awareness, you know, might actually be a, a change uh, for for the better. Being able to say, okay, look, we told you this is a problem. You know, we're we're recording it accordingly. That way, we're CYA, right? Security raised this mm. issue. That way, whenever it does happen, or we feel like it's going to happen, that's a problem. Um, how how important is it to? That's a process, and you know, there's no tool connected to it. But I mean, it feels like that that would be a very important process to have to raise those risks, not just you know from the threat model or you know maybe follow on pen testing or whatever. But our priorities are not always the priorities of people who create features and have to put those things out. So. Um, how important is it to have a risk acceptance process in the in the organization? So the answer is very important. Um, <laughs> no, I'd say I, I want I want to. I'd hope so. Uh, preface, I'd hope so. So yeah, I want, I want to preface it by saying that um, I think one of the key things to be able to do is to you know to understand the product you're dealing with, the application you're dealing with well enough to be able to take a good view on that. You know, you may you know, often we take a very sort of dry security perspective, okay, well, this is a vulnerability. Okay, well, what, what, what application is that vulnerability in? What data is in the application? How urgent is that compared to other things? So I think often having that um, in-depth knowledge of you know, what are we actually dealing with here is, 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 is critical for this process. And it's critical to be able to make accurate assessments. Um, so I'm, I, I, think, I think that's important to, to highlight because I think it's also a classic, um, it comes up a lot, let's say, bug bounty. You know, when I'm we're, we're interacting with people who have found a bug bounty finding, like, oh, you've got this finding in this application, it's terrible, it's diabolical. I'm like, well, yeah, that's, a, that's a nice finding, but you know, there, there are reasons why that's less bad, why, you know, why we'd lower priority, reduce the priority. And you know, a bug bounty person won't necessarily know that because they're all on the outside. But as the internal person, I, I need to be aware of that. I need, I need to know enough to be able to say, well, okay, this bug bounty person says it's critical and everything's on fire, but I know enough to know, okay, well, I'm not going to you know, create a war room and drag in all the developers because I know that actually... There are other factors here um, here at play, right. um, so you have to have that, I guess, domain specific knowledge, that app, product specific knowledge, application specific knowledge to be able to make that determination. Um, but once you know, once you've got that, then it's all another part of shift of the shift up concept. It's saying, okay, well, we need the time to do this. We need buy-in from the leadership. We need buy-in to say, look, if we say that this needs to be dealt with, then we need to sort of get this dealt with within an acceptable period of time. We can't be in a situation where it's constantly being pushed off by, okay, well, this feature or that feature. You know, we need to have agreement that you know, we're going to be careful about when, you know, when we blow that big whistle saying, okay, there's a critical issue. We need to deal with it. But we need to, ha as a, you know, as, as a quid, quid pro quo, as the, uh, we need to have leadership buy-in to say, okay, well, if security say it's important, we're going to take it seriously. We're, we're going to deal with it. And we're going to we're going to we're going to address it. And if it's not critical, okay, we'll have a slightly more relaxed time frame, but we'll still have a time frame and have that agreement up front, saying, you know, for these, you know, the for this product or these applications, this is a time frame in which we have to deal with this. And yes, we're going to fit in features at the same time. We're going to maintain you know, velocity of development, but we're not going to lose sight. It's not going to be something that's just pushed off and pushed off and pushed off. Um, but that again, that's something that needs that sort of senior le leadership buy-in to say, well, yes, we. We, you know, we, we accept that we want the product to be secure. Therefore, when security say we need to address this, then we're going to have to address it within the, within the pre-arranged timescales. Yeah. Um, and if we do, and if we don't, then we're going to have to have a process that says, well, look, like you know, security raised at this point. These are the, you know the, 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 we've not dealt with this for whatever reason. You know, at the leadership level, it's understood. Okay, we have not dealt with this. We understand what the business reason for not dealing with this is. But you know, it's not something that's just stuck within security. And you know, it's it's just a security problem. But it's something that's understood a level higher than security or a level more you know, broader than security that, okay, we have this, we have this issue that's not been dealt with. Right. I, I like, I like the idea of, uh, you know, using things like your bug bounty program to help inform risk, because usually what, what you have to do for a bug bounty program is you have to set, you know, material damage externally because, uh, you know, every vulnerability found has been found by somebody, not your company. So, that should automatically raise the risk that it is discoverable externally, which you know is one of those things. So you can realize that risk. Uh, you add a dollar value to a lot of these things. It's like, okay, this vulnerability cost us twenty thousand dollars, or this this vulnerability cost us ten thousand dollars, or you know, because we you know it, the rules of engagement have labeled them as critical. And I think probably uh, getting buy-in from development on, hey, what is a critical? You know, if it's a configuration issue, if it's a memory leak, or what have you, uh, having them. Uh, you know, have buy-in on your your bug bounty program and what they consider critical, so that they will also treat it critically, uh, is is very important. I think a lot of that is just collaboration and and um, 
breaking down some of those communication silos. Uh, you know, we used to call them swim lanes. I call them silos now uh, because, you know, that's what it is. Anytime we're not collaborating with other people, it's it's a silo for me. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, uh, some of those can get very expensive over time. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's one of the, one of those things where you know, we t we talked earlier on about sort of the the greenfield ideal state and sort of the existing legacy state, and I guess, but yeah, bug bug bounty and the, the, the it sort of feeds into the concept the concept of the expert comes from outside. Yes, an internal right. security person says, "Oh, there's this problem." Then, you know, depending on what the relationship internally is like, that may be well received or not well received. It depends on how well the security you know, how, how good the relationship is with the security team with the wider organization but if you know someone from outside of a bug bounty person finds it and suddenly you've got something to point to say look that person found it and they're like oh this expert bug bounty hunter found it we now need to need to deal with it so right um i don't i don't love that because i it's one of those sort of uh um less optimal situations but it, it 100 percent can help you know both because yeah. bug bounty has a real cost because have um you, know, they, you generally end up paying them a certain amount of money for their finding um, mm -hmm. because it clearly demonstrates not only is this an issue, but someone on the outside has looked and they have found this issue and it is completely validated. Um, so it's, it certainly can be a powerful tool from that perspective, although, uh, yeah, right. it makes me a little bit sad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even well, even before then, you can use that example. It's like, look, we have a bug bounty program. If we're going to consider this a risk and not going to fix it before it launches, you know, you you could add that that discussion is hey hey we have a bug bounty program if this ships is some, would somebody from the bug bounty you know researchers would they be able to find this issue and that that would that would help you know in the risk acceptance process to maybe not accept that risk and say okay yeah you know if they if they do this then they'll be able to and you kind of have to level with your developers I think with a lot of folks and 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 I think we're going to talk about product versus application security here in, in a second but. Um, you kind of need to be real with your developers and 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 folks about what researchers will do to your bugs. Uh, and it, it some of it's a smash and grab, or you know if you're dealing with hardware or something like that, they will find the JTAG on your device and they will dump your firmware. Uh, so any code quality issues in there, you know that's why SCA tools are important because when they dump your firmware, they're going to be able to analyze your malware and they'll find your memory leak. They'll find your you know your libraries that are you know, incredibly old and outdated and what have you. So um, shifting to that question, uh, one of the questions you you added, thankfully, to the to the chat here, uh, to the to the document is how does product security differ from application security? And I asked the question, I said, what if the product is an application? I, I don't know if you make a delineation between what a product and an application is. Um, but is there a difference between product security and application security? So there's definitely a difference. I think there are lots of different uh, opinions as to what that actual uh, difference is. I guess my the way the way I see it is that application security is sort of focused on a, on you know, how you build a piece of uh, how you build some code securely, how you write code securely, how you build features securely. Whereas I guess where the way I see product security is is a wider view. It's saying okay, I'm not just build writing a piece of code. I'm not just writing an application. I am building some sort of software product or possibly even a hardware product as well. There, there is a there is a, a wider deliverable here that I need to be thinking about as well. It's not just okay. Am I you know if I've got SQL injection bugs in my code? It's more okay. Well, there's going to be a whole life cycle around this product. You know, maybe if this is a, a self-hosted product, then there's going to be all sorts of considerations around how we host our product, how our you know our cloud environment works, how we get this application from our um, developers' <laughs> laptops to our cloud environment. You know what that process looks like. These are you know all sorts of, of, of wider considerations. Um, there's also the response aspect as well. You know, the product security instant instant response team. We talk a lot about instant response. I think we probably talk a little bit less about instant response when it's in your application. When it's okay, you're right. hosting this application, um, or even <laughs> you're delivering this application to be installed on premises. Okay, there's a vulnerability in it. Now what? You know, who? <laughs> how do we respond to that? How do we deal with that? How do we discover that? What's the the whole process around there look like? So I think it's about saying, well, application security came to solve a particular problem, came to solve a particular issue around, okay, well, how do we write code securely? How do we build a, an application security? And product security expands on that and says, okay, well, we've now got a whole load of other considerations that are relevant in the life cycle of this product. Um, and, and another part of that is that thinking a little bit more widely as well. Say, okay, we're not just thinking about you know, the security vulnerabilities in our, in our product or you know, building features in a secure way, but also what security features do we want? 
what features do we want in our products to actually enable security, enable security for our users? Things like multi-factor authentication, um, things like um, you know, lo logging of the way that different security controls in the application work so we can detect attacks on that application. All sorts of features that aren't necessarily about how we build future security, but rather you know, how do we make sure that our, our product offers security features to its users or to people hosting it? Or you know, again, it's this wider remit. It's thinking about, okay, we're not just dealing with a piece of code here. We're not just dealing with an application here. We are dealing with a product with considerations around that. Mm. Right on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can, I can definitely see that. So applications feed up into a product or like you said, with hardware and software, you've got applications that run on the product and every one of those represents a potential weakness. And I think what you're talking about or what, what I'm alluding to is here supply chain security. And we've had a very recent issue with that, uh, with the XZ library. We've seen it with Log4j. We've seen it with libcurl, uh, libwebp, you know, ffmpeg, any, any of these open source vulnerabilities that come out. Um, for, for the most part, I think they're mostly open source vulnerabilities, but they represent uh, a, a needed visibility into our supply chain, into, into what, what is working here. Um, in 2018, of course, uh, CISA started up the NTIA, the, uh, the National Telecoms and Information Administration stakeholder process. So SBOMs are all the new hotness. Uh, do you see SBOMs as a, I mean, they're going to have to be put in. So it's going to require a non-zero level of effort from security and from developers in the long run, depending on who you work with, uh, with eventual, I think, adoption across the entire industry. But what do, what do you see that looking like in the future? Because, I mean, S-bombs can be very generic or they can be really, really dense. And uh, there's there's a happy medium there. But what do you see as a happy medium in, in, in regards to that? So I guess when I think of S-bombs, I, th I think of SCA tools because it's sort of, you know, ultimately the SCA tools, the um, software composition analysis, it's sort of the, the basis of that. You know, what's going into my piece of software? What's going into my application? What's going into my product? Um, and SCA tools are, are, I guess, very sort of uh, well known for coming up with all sorts of vulnerabilities, and you suddenly raises all these questions about reachability and am I actually vulnerable to this issue? Am I not vulnerable to this issue? But one of the things that SCA tools or a good SCA tools should give you, aside from all that, is situational awareness. It gives you visibility mm -hmm. of what's actually going on in my application, what's actually going on in my product, and that's you know, where I think the S bomb concept becomes really important. Because you know, it may be that you know, there, are, there are all sorts of reasons why you're going to have a backlog of potential actual vulnerabilities. But having the power to say, OK, I know that there is this you know, burning down the internet vulnerability in this library. Where am I using that library? Uh, and that you know, comes from, OK, where am I using that library within my own applications that I've built in? Where am I using that, that library in other products that I'm using? You know, maybe third-party products. Do I have an SBOM for that third-party product? So I can figure out, well, do they have this issue? Do I need to speak to them about getting a patch or getting some sort of update? You know, having that, the ability to know okay, what is going on in my environment. What do I have in my environment? And I think that, and that, that's a, a pretty key, um, key thing to be able to have. And you know, like I said, we could talk, <laughs> and I do talk lots about you know, how to deal with the, the vulnerabilities aspect of SCAs and you know, plowing through all of those and how you prioritize and how you triage and what's real, what's not real. But just that situational awareness, just that inventory, I think, is is really, really important. And you know, I think that that factor of having um, an S-bomb for your own product, for products that you're using is really, really useful to you know, when something does happen, to be able to react to it fast and be able to deal with it quickly and you know, mitigate where it's necessary. Right. Right. That makes sense. So. You talked about S bomb as having a goal of being able to do visibility, or you know, in some ways, kind of a light threat intelligence. You know, you you understanding what's going on under the hood. Uh, you you also mentioned that tools should have a goal, and and I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out what you, what you meant by goal. Is it a goal from metrics wise to show how effective your system is, or uh, how secure it is, or is it a a, a bit of both? So. I guess when I talk about tools having a goal, the way I see it is that too many organizations have said, oh, we need a SaaS tool. Oh, we need an SCA tool. And their goal has been to implement that tool. But that's not, that's not security. That's not bringing, bringing you security. You, know, you want to have a tool or you want to have a process to solve a particular problem. 
I am worried about developers writing insecure code. I'm worried about them writing vulnerabilities into my product. Now, I could, as a security person, go line by line through the code the developers are writing and try and figure that out. Or I could bring in a tool that can help me with this problem, that can find um, vulnerabilities at the code level and flag them up to me, or at the very least, you know, point me in the right direction so I know where to look and where, where I might be concerned about. So my goal is to make sure my developers are uh, not writing vulnerabilities into my application. Um, in the same way, you know, I'm concerned about, I've got all sorts of third-party libraries, all sorts of other content going into my application. There are, are risks associated with that. So my goal is to have visibility about it, um, of what's going into my product. It may be that my goal is also to not deploy things that have a CVSS of 10 into my you know, release version of the product. That's my goal. Now, I can use an SCA tool, software composition analysis tool, to, to help me with that. But the, you know, the goal here isn't to implement the tool. The tool the, I'm not measuring, can I implement the tool? I'm measuring, can I solve the problem using the tool? And I think all too often, you know, like I say, we, App State becomes in, implement SAS, implement DAS, implement SCA, implement this tool, implement that tool. But the goal should be, okay, what's the problem I'm trying to solve? And then how am I going to use the tool to achieve that? I think that reframing is very important when we come to actually plan, okay, well, how are we going to use that tool? Who's going to be involved? You know, we talked earlier on about RACI, about different people. You know, and the same thing comes with tools as well. You know, let's say, for argument's sake, you've got a tool that you're implementing on-premises. It's a little bit sort of maybe old school, but you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there are still plenty of organizations that want their tools to be on-premises, their code is on-premises. So suddenly you have lots of different people involved in that. You know, okay, this is an SCA, this is an AppSec tool. Well, it's not just AppSec people are supposed to be dealing with this. You may need IT people to actually get it installed internally. You may need DevOps people to build it into the pipelines that are compiling the code and that can then be used to scan the code. Um, and obviously you need developers to actually potentially address the output or, you know, after the security people look at the output to address that output. So again, we have a goal. We want to build a process to solve that problem, to achieve that goal. And we need different people involved in order to do that. And we're probably going to use a tool to do that. We're probably going to use a tool to accelerate that process. But the tool isn't the process. The tool isn't the goal. And I think that's an important sort of mind shift, an important way of looking at, okay, well, how am I going to address a particular software security problem? Right. So could the developers have a different goal for solving the same problem that security would? Is it necessary for developers and security to align on having the same goal for the same problem? Or is it is it like an enemy of an enemy is my friend kind of thing where it's like developers are wanting to solve memory issues because of blah, security wants to fix it because of blah. Completely different goals, but the same the same thing is achieved, but they have different ideas on on you know um, on why they need to fix that goal. So, I guess you know, for the most part in security, it's generally okay. We're you know our, our goal is to improve security in some particular dimension. Our, our goal is to solve a particular security problem, and you know for the developer, they, their their primary goal might be okay. I want this to not give me a massive headache. I want this to not not take up be, be too kind time consuming. Um, but I think that if you can get to a situation where the developers are themselves seeing the value in the tool, I think that's even more powerful. Um, so we did something interesting. There's, um, we started looking at, there, there are certain SaaS tools, the sort of the, the secure code scanning tools that let you write your own rules. Um, I'll name drop it. I don't mind. Um, it's a tool called SEMGREP, which is, uh, has an open source version that lets you write your own rules and then you can scan code and find issues in your code using the, using those rules. Now, you know, you can build all sorts of rules to find all sorts of security issues. Um, and we we spent some time, I did a uh, talk um, a few months back now, well, it was more, almost a year, time flies, um, with, my, with my colleague Michal. We did a, a talk at PyCon, a Python conference, about basically using SEMGREP, building custom rules, and solving sort of security problems. And we showed you know, the, the people that came to PyCon, Python developers, and we showed them this, and they're like, you know, we can think of so many non-security problems that we could solve with this tool by you know just general right. awareness information about our code or finding things in our code. It's not a security thing. It's just we want to search our code for a particular thing. And you know they they're excited about this tool because it solved other problems we hadn't even thought about. Right. Um, so that's also a really powerful thing as well. I mean, <laughs> Michal is also doing a course at Black Hat. Um, she's doing a course around building sort of custom security testing and uh, very much you know continuing on from that idea of saying you know how can we take these 
tools that are ostensibly for security or ostensibly to solve particular problems and how can we customize them to, to solve other problems as well not every, every tool can do that but if you can get to that situation where you have this i guess win-win process where you're solving a security problem but you're also bringing something that developers like and helps developers then you know that's a that's a really great position to be in so SEMGRIP, I, I don't know if SEMGRIP was a security tool that developers could use. Um, I, I, I assume that there is, is this a failing of security to not be able to sell SEMGRIP to developers? Or maybe, you know, we don't know how to suggest to them how this would benefit them. We want them to use the tool because it benefits us. Um, you know, what's in it for me is kind of a thing that I, that I like to ask at work. It's like, yeah, this is great to suggest, but what's in it for me? Right. What what do I get out of it? What you know, what is what is the developers going to get out of mm -hmm. using SEMGRIP? And like you said, you showed it to them and they're like, holy crap, I can use this for so many other things. Is this I don't want to say is this a failing of security to say, hey, here's a good tool we should use. And, and on the other side of the coin, are there developer tools that developers are using that would be like, hey, security people we're using this because of this, but it might actually be a security uh, tool that would be would be useful. I think I think it all comes down to this. You know, talked about the Department of No. I think you know the, this historic mindset of security being you know, the the gatekeepers against the, the 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 hordes of mass on the outside, and you know security is the one who makes the rules, and everyone must obey security. And it comes from you know that that mind shift change of saying, okay, well, let's think ourselves of as advocates for security. We're trying to um, get buy-in for security. We're trying to get people to like security. We're trying to get people to want to um, adopt. What we want to do we're not using fear we're using sort of this you know love and outreach approach and i think right. that once you have that mind shift chef the mind um mind mindset shift and you have this situation we're thinking well how you know how can i make this good for developers as well how can i make this easier for developers how can i find positives for them as well i mean we talked earlier on about training and this idea okay well we can give the developers a whole load of videos and that will teach them about secure coding but i, I don't want to do that i want to find some sort of interactive platform. I want it to be fun for them. You know, I want to think, oh, I'm going to spend three hours working on this fun platform and it's going to be challenged and it's going to be gamified and I'm going to learn, but I'm also going to have fun at the same time. You know, I want them to have a positive experience. I want it to be useful for them. And I think that is a really important mind shift change. The idea that you know, we're not, you know, maybe once security is the part of no, but you know, when we talk about application security, when we talk about product security, you know, that has to be the, the person who the developer is happy to see, the person the developer wants to work with and that is you know making the developer happy and bring them things that are going to be beneficial for them. And yes, you know, there is going to be some commitment required from the developer. Hopefully, we can get and buy in from up you know, from senior um, people in order to make that easier. But you know, there's always going to be that investment from them. But we want to bridge that gap. We want to make it a happier experience for them as well. And you know, Sengrep is just one example of well, there's you know, there's a plus side as well because you can use this tool and you can do fun things with this tool as well. But uh, you know, lots of other ways to try and. You know, build that engagement, make people happy. You, know, you talked about DevRel. You know, it's very much the same thing. It's advocating for security. It's trying to make um, security more accepted amongst developers. Very nice. Yeah. Um, I was trying to find that PyCon talk that you gave with, uh, with with your friend there. I was also looking up the training that you'd mentioned on uh, on Black Hat for the... Uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll find it. I, they have the list of them already available. Uh, looks like you have until the end of May to get in on the early bird pricing if you're going to go to Black Hat. So, um, yeah, I'll send, uh, maybe I'll send us quick the links afterwards. You can add them to the show notes or something. That'd be great. Okay. Um, cool. So, uh, I, I, I think, I think, um, I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. I know that it's, uh, you know, late for you and, um, I have to actually hit a meeting in about 20 minutes. So, uh, any any last thoughts? I know that you're also I don't want I want to say you're also big in ASVS, which is the uh, the OWASP you know uh, security verification system. But uh, has there been any change? I want to say has there been any changes? There's always changes to ASVS, but I mean you know uh, it's changed quite a bit since 1.0, which I think we looked at back in 2017. Uh, are you are you looking at uh, you know what worked then, what works now for like the next iteration of ASVS? Uh, you know, how, how, how has that process changed since you, you first envisioned it? So, so I got involved with ASVS um, a few years back when version, version four came out. And we've had some minor changes since then, but no major changes. And what we're trying to do now is trying to push out a, a, a more major change. You know, things, things have moved along since 2019. We want to try and, uh, Make sure the way we're accommodating that, and we also want to make it easier to use. I think one of the 
one of the biggest challenges of ASVS is it's very large. You know, it's a very, very big, big piece of uh, um, documentation. I mean, the ASVS is the Application Security Verification Standard, and it's got basically requirements to help people either build software in a secure way or verify that uh, a piece of software is secure. And you know, version 4 in total has about 200 and something requirements. So it's, it's quite large, and I think part of it is going to be about trying to make it easier to adopt and, and easier to get into. So right now, our, our goal is very much trying to go through the different chapters and try and refresh them and uh, you know, ask, ask the community, you know, is this still important or is this um, less important or are there other things that we should be adding to here? And <clears throat> we, we develop an app in the opening GitHub so everyone can sort of see where that's up to. But we're definitely trying to push out that new version. And uh, if anyone wants to get involved or anyone's got comments or is interested, then certainly look up uh, the GitHub repository and we're very active in the uh, the issues there and you know, pushing our making making our way towards version five. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, I've posted up a link. It'll be in the show notes for the the podcast and the VOD as well. Uh, so y you work for OWASP. Uh, we have Kevin. We had Kevin Johnson on co a couple weeks ago as member at large for being um, in OWASP. It's kind of how I met you. I, I think we mentioned you know Kevin was coming on and you said hey I'd love to get on. I was like yes I'd love to have you. Uh, how what's the dynamic of working in an organization like OWASP where you know it's it's for the most part I would say and correct me if I'm wrong here but it's it's mostly a volunteer kind of thing so people are I wouldn't say doing it out of the kindness of their hearts but you know there there's it's a volunteer only thing right so they they get out only what they you know only only what they put into it right uh, what what does the dynamic look like for a wasp for certain things like ASVS or you know there there must be a lot of uh, you know projects there that get very little attention but are very you know instrumental to uh, a wasp you know everybody thinks of the top ten right some people think of the ASVS stuff there's some threat modeling like threat dragon threat dragon threat dragon yeah. uh, how how is it some days for you to motivate people or to get comments for things like, you know, ASVS. How often do you get comments that aren't the same 15 or 20 people, you know, talking about something because those are just the normal people? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you know, OWASP is, is certainly not my day job. You know, my, my, my day job, I work as a consultant, work, as, uh, work, work with uh, development organizations and other organizations who develop software. And, you know, OWASP is very much sort of a... Um, you know, passion project and you know, something that I'm involved with on, on a volunteer basis. And it's, you know, it's, again, it's something you sometimes have to fit in around other things. It's something that, you know, obviously can't be your, your, your nine to five. And therefore it's, there's, there's challenges around that. But on the other hand, it's, you know, a fantastic way of meeting people, a fantastic way of you know, interacting with other people in the, in the, uh, in the industry. And it is generally you know, getting a, a building a better network of, People who you know understand this, you can ask for help. You can ask for ideas, and you know, I think there are, there are a lot of benefits to actually being involved involved as a volunteer, even though it do, does take up some time. Um, in terms of you know ongoing contributions, on ongoing involvement. So you know, for most projects, have leaders. All projects have leaders who are sort of the the primary people involved um, over the course you know the course of the project's life. Some leaders are more active, some leaders are less active. And then you know, the, the idea is we want to then try and get other people involved, especially at uh, higher, at uh, you know, busier times or at times where we've got you know, something something new that's come out that we want people to look over. So you know, we're currently working towards version five of ASVS, and we're hoping to have a draft of that at some point over the next few months. At that point, we'll probably make a lot of noise, both personally and through our OWASP, saying, "Okay, here is the new draft. Here is the new release candidate. Have your say. Have your you know, have your input, and uh, you know, let, let us know what you think." I think you know, it's hard to have a a very large pool of people over over a large period of time, but having a lot of people involved in a, over a short period of time, where we've got okay, here's a here's a release candidate, here's a new um, version, you know, take a look. I think people are definitely keen to be involved in that, and definitely keen to uh, to have their say. And we certainly saw around ASBS four, a lot of people were involved in reviewing and making suggestions on the release candidate, and we we expect similar for for version five as well. But you know, I got involved very with good. OWASP in 2017, and you know, since then. It's been you know, fantastic experiences, really interesting, and it taken me a lot, a lot of different places and met a lot of different people. Very cool. Um, yeah, I, I don't come from a coding background, and, and Kevin tells me that you know I don't have to have a coding background or I don't have to be necessarily a developer to do these things. I just wonder, 
Um, what what it, what would a contribution be for somebody who's in upper lower middle management with a, a dearth of experience across you know many many industry verticals? It's like, uh, do you use PMs like you use PMs at uh, you know normal companies? Do you need somebody who's a cat wrangler or uh, you know is that a, is it a somewhat thankless job to be somebody who's like okay hey you know there's another RFC? I mean what does what does being a PM look like for the OWASP organization? How do you use them like that? So I think that. Certain projects have got this figured out better than other, other projects. I think at ASVS, we've sort of been very focused on our you know, core thing of, okay, we, we write security requirements. And I think historically, we've been less good at thinking about the, the other roles that would well help us as well. So you know, there are other projects that are slightly, you know, have, have sort of adopted that slightly more, something like Cyclone DX, which is the, um, the uh, OWASP, uh, I guess it's project around sort of S-bombs and uh, you know, supply chain. And Cyclone DX have a quite a large team of you know, core people, some of whom work on the standard itself, others work on you know, promoting on social media, others work on sort of managing the overall project or interacting with the community. And I think there's certainly room for that as well. And you know, in SVS, we're trying to think about how we can, can broaden our appeal as well. You know, certainly ha you know, having product manager, project managers to try and allocate particular tasks or make you know, see how particular tasks are doing, work towards a particular goal. And that's certainly, certainly something that's needed. You know, a lot of the projects also are um, documentation projects. There are all sorts of things around, you know, just making sure the documentation comes out right, looks right, um, and you know that more more technical sides of that. Some you know might be a, a developer might be very good at, or might even be a DevOps person, but they might be very good at say pipelines and GitHub Actions, but they're not super familiar with security. But you know a lot of OWASP projects use GitHub Actions to to process the out the, the documents and or process the code and come out with, a, with an output. So I think there's definitely scope for for people with different roles, different backgrounds to be involved as well. Very cool. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't have anything else. I want, I just wanted to leave you with the last word. Is there any, anything else you'd like to, to say before we take off? Um, yeah, you know, I think that, you know, I think, I think AppSec is, is, is product security. It's just a, it's a fascinating area. It's a very, you know, it took me a, it took me a while when I was sort of coming up through security to really understand sort of what it was all about. And I, I guess I'm still learning to a certain extent, but you know, I think it's, I think it's really interesting. I think it's becoming more important. You know, certainly, you know, the many organizations are software development organizations today, and many organizations are not software development organizations, but they end up developing a lot of software. You know, I worked for a client that was involved in manufacturing, and you know, they, they were a manufacturing co company. They built things, but it turned out that all their in-house apps had been built, developed in-house. They weren't buying off the shelf. They had people, developers internally doing that. Now, suddenly, they're a software organization. So I think it's very much all a, you know, a very widespread thing is something that does require a certain level of understanding and skill and you know, i think part of the idea of the black hat course is to say well you know i'm for this particular course let's talk to security people about application security let's talk to you about how to approach this how to get into this um but i guess it comes down to a few key key principles from my perspective which is you know the first is that you know, security is not necessarily a developer's job we definitely need to make sure that you know we're either trying to get it made their job or we're accommodating that and we're um building that relationship you know, security, we don't want to be the department of no, we don't want to be a blocker, we want to be an enabler, we want to be people who are helping development. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're bringing them things that will help them, bringing things that will work where they are, that meet them where they are, and not just bring them endless problems. And I think, you know, the, by having this mindset, having this attitude, and you know, understanding, okay, how can we build into the existing processes? I think it's going to make you know, an overall software security program, product security program, a lot more successful and you know, hopefully have. Um, far more significant impact. So yeah, hopefully that's been uh, a useful overview. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, uh, Josh Grossman, thank you for for being on. Thank you for staying late with us here today um, and doing this. Uh, you know, on um, on on your own time. I'd like to thank Bounce for allowing you to have that hour, hour and a half to to be able to do that. Uh, by the way, if you want to check out Bounce Security, you can go to bouncesecurity.com, I believe. is. Let me go check my... I yeah. have it in the show notes as well. Uh, it's, yeah, bouncesecurity.com. If you're interested in, uh, you know, getting getting involved, or, you know, getting Josh's help uh, or, or any of their other teammates to, uh, you know, help with your AppSec stuff. Um, yeah, uh, how would people find you if they wanted to, to get online other than Bounce Security? I mean, if there's uh, other places that you blog or anything like that. Um, so the best place to get hold of me is probably uh, either Twitter or LinkedIn. I'm sort of reasonably uh, active on both those platforms. I do a bit of blog blogging, blogging through Bounce. Um, if you want to go on okay. to the Bounce blog, you can see some 
sort of in-depth in the weeds fun I had recently with a particular software library. Uh, I do some personal blogging as well, but le le less so. But uh, yeah, okay. most, of, most of the time I'm uh, it's Twitter and LinkedIn, the best ways. I'll yeah, put the links in the show notes, probably easiest. Yep. Yeah, I've got uh, I've got links to your LinkedIn uh, also to actually I found your your blog site. You've got a recent article from February up about pass keys, which I I, I plan on reading oh, yes. a little bit later. <laughs> and uh, cool. All right. Uh, so thank you, Josh, for for coming. Appreciate that. Appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for you know join, uh, joining us on the stream chat. Uh, we will have this up on YouTube VOD later uh, for, for everybody who might have missed uh, a little bit of it. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming and listening to our special episode here on uh, BreakSec Education. You can find me on Twitter at Brian Break. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, just do a search for my name. Uh, Miss Berlin, who uh, could not make it today, or Mr. Betcher, Miss Berlin's info sister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R on Twitter. Uh, Mr. Betcher can be found on LinkedIn as well. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Hope you have a, a good day. We should be on our regular Twitch stream tomorrow uh, at 3 p.m. Pacific. And I'd like to thank all of our new chatters as well. And that was it for our show this week. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, you know, have a great week. Take care of yourselves because as we're fond of saying here, you're the only you you have. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye, y'all.